everyone here, in one way or another, desires to be chosen. Everybody wants someone to say to them, I choose you. It's, it's hardwired inside of us. As a child, we want friends to choose us to be their friend. We want to make the team and have the coach say, I choose you. Not long after that, we want to catch the eye and affection of another. We want to apply to a college and open up the letter and have the college say, I choose you. We want to propose to someone and have them not make us a YouTube sensation over the rejection, but actually say, yes, I as well choose you. We want the employer to choose us. There's not a stage in our life. When we don't long to be chosen, it's, it's a part of who we are. There's not a person in this room that doesn't want someone to say to them, I choose you. God placed that desire inside of you. Many grew up wondering, does anyone want me? Am, am I not wanted? And many have spent much of their life just wanting someone to say, I choose, I want you. You know, we all have some baggage that we carry, pains and hurts. I do, you do. But I'm here to declare to you today that there is a God, there is one, there is one who will say to you, I choose you with all of your past and baggage and pain. I choose you. You're not a burden to God. You haven't been pushed on God. God doesn't just tolerate us. God chooses us. And maybe you've only ever experienced a works-based love. Act a certain way. Dress a certain way. Earn a certain amount of money. Be really good in sports. Then, then you'll get love. But see, that's not true with God. We don't have to earn God's love at all. God says, I choose you. And no matter who you are, where you're from, in this room, watching online, podcasting this later, you will never be more loved than you are right now in this moment where you sit. Because God came to find us. God came to choose us. We don't have to go look for Jesus. We don't have to go look for God. He came for us. If you didn't know this, Jesus isn't lost. <laughs> it's not like one day Jesus was sitting at the right hand of the Father. The next day God gets up. Where in the world is Jesus? He keeps running off. He's lost. He's not lost. We are. But he came to find us. And he came to save us. And he came to choose us. And what he wants for us is for us to believe in him and for us to follow him. And that's what we're going to learn today in one very powerful but simple verse in 1 John that says this. Now this is his command, that's God, that we believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another as he commanded us. He chooses us, he runs after us. And what he wants from us is for us to believe in him and then love others in the way that he loved us. So, Lord, today, just a few words from John, but such a powerful grouping of words and a command to both believe and to love. And those two are so interconnected. So help us today to truly know what it means to believe in Jesus and to love as he loves. In his name we pray. And everybody said... Amen. So we're in our series called Up at Night, and we're walking through the book of 1 John, actually in reverse. So if you have a copy of the Bible, open it up. We're going to be in 1 John 3. We started in chapter 5. We're working our way backwards to chapter 1. John, who wrote this, is a follower of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus, an apostle. He wrote the Gospel of John that we studied. He wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, wrote the book of Revelation. He's the disciple whom Jesus loved. He knew Jesus, loved Jesus, followed Jesus. And he's actually, in 1st John, writing to a church to help them understand critical questions that people ask. How do I know that I'm saved? How do I know that I'm loved? How do I love others? John is wanting to give the church he's writing to an assurance of their faith so they're not up at night wrestling with what to believe about God. We don't want you to be up at night 
wrestling with what to believe about God. And so today we're going to look at this one passage and learn how do I love others really well. And it begins back with with a powerful word. It says, now this is his command that we what? What's the word? Believe. And we're going to see exactly what he wants us to believe in. And he says, I want you to believe in the name of his son. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah. His son, Jesus Christ. And so to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, that means to place your faith, your trust, everything that you are in who Jesus is. And to believe so strongly in Jesus, in his way, that it changes the very course of your life and the very essence of who you are. It says we're going to believe in all that Jesus is. And there's so much to learn about who Jesus is and these three words, his son, Jesus Christ. And so let's look first at this word here, his son. He says, believe in the name of his son. And the reason why that's so important is because his son emphasizes the deity of Jesus Christ, the godness of of Jesus Christ and his unique sonship with the Father. This is God's Son we're talking about. This is God in the flesh that we're talking about. This is second member of the Trinity that we're talking about. This is the Son of God, God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth that we're talking about. That's what he means when he says his Son. But then he says his Son, Jesus. And this is important because Jesus means the Lord is salvation. Isn't that good? That this God, this creator, this sustainer, this second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, is also our salvation. So he created us, but he's coming after us. He made the world, and he's wanting to rescue those who live in the world. So he is the salvation that we need. And this name Jesus comes from Joshua, which also helps us understand that Jesus had a humanity to him. That's his human name, his earthly name. So he walked among us and he didn't just look down from heaven, but he walked in this earth. So his son, Jesus, and lastly, Christ. This is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word Messiah, meaning he's the promised one. The Bible tells one story from beginning to end. And as soon as sin entered the world in Genesis 3, God said, a Savior's coming. And so Christ means he's the promised one of the Old Testament. So believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. There's a lot in that. And this word Jesus Christ here, that is the the oldest uh, and earliest of Christian confessions about what they believed about Jesus. Humanity and divinity all in one together. And so if we're going to obey the command that John gives us to believe In the name of his son, Jesus Christ, here's what it means. It means you place your faith. You place your trust in Jesus and all that he is. The divine son of God, incarnate, in flesh deity, the sinless human, the promised Messiah, the Savior. It's our trust and belief in him that he is the Savior, our Lord, our rescuer, our key to life everlasting, and our source of everything that we need in this world. And when you believe in the name of Jesus Christ, it's beautiful. God adopts you. He invites you. He receives you. He chooses you into his family. You're chosen. Doesn't matter who you are. You're chosen when you believe, you know. The reality is there's going to be a lot of people who fail you, but God will never fail you. And there are going to be people who leave you, but God will never leave you. Because when we believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior, we get a new name and a new identity and a new hope and a new life. And I know some of you are like, man, you don't even know me. I just started coming. You don't know my story. I have sinned in ways that I'll never be able to take back. And the sin that's a part of my past is going to define me for the rest of my life. You feel like you'll never be whole or forgiven. And the reality is, I cannot speak for how others might respond to you, how your family might respond to you, how some in this church might respond to you. I don't, I don't know how they might respond. I hope 
I know how some would respond, but I can't speak for them. But, but what I do have today is the honor to speak today for the one who created the world. And the one who made you, and the one who chose you, and the one who ran after you, and the one who sent his son to save you. And he said, when you believe, you're forgiven. And when you believe you're whole, and when you believe your son, your daughter, you are clean. And so John says, believe. Believe in Jesus. And when you do, you belong to him. And John is writing to the church, and he's urging them, don't let it just be words. Believe. It's a command. That's what he's saying. Look back at verse 23. This is his command. It's a, not a suggestion. It's a command that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. And what's interesting about this passage is believing in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. This is the only place in the New Testament where it's written down just like this in the date of. It's powerful what John is doing here. Only place in the New Testament. Why is that so important? Because John is acutely aware of our need for a Savior and that Jesus is the only one. And so he places a high importance on this verse right here in this moment, saying you need to believe. It's the only place in the New Testament written like this. And other theologians also say this is also known as the greatest commandment because the command to believe is not the only thing that John commands us to believe. He also commands, if, if you look, he commands us to love one another. So there's a command to believe, but there's also a command to love. And listen, this is why it's important. Because when we believe in God, he chooses us. He loves us. He forgives us. We're his. We get his love. And then he commands us to love others. We're commanded to believe and we receive his love. But then we're commanded to give it away. So listen, Christianity, if you're new to the Bible or new to church, Christianity is not just about receiving the love of Jesus. No, no, Christianity is also about giving away the love of Jesus. It's not just about receiving mercy, it's about giving mercy. Love doesn't just flow to us, love is supposed to flow through us. And this is important because if we feel like, listen, this is a big deal, if we feel like we have been loved only a little, then we will love little. If we feel like we've only been loved a little, then we're going to love little. But, but if we feel like we have experienced an eternity altering, new name giving, soul saving love, the greatest love in the universe, then we're going to love others with a massive type of love. The extent to which you know your love will determine your ability to love others. It's a big deal. So John says, believe. And when you believe, that's demonstrated by actions. Belief's not just words. There's an evidence of your belief. There's actions. The Bible says there's proof, evidence in your life that your belief was true, that belief produces action. It's the same with love. Love cannot be just words. We have to have demonstrable acts of love. God acted in a major way towards us. We must act in major ways towards others. So the command in this passage is both to believe and to love. They're linked together. And I love the way Daniel Aiken says it. Theologian, scholar, speaker. Listen, he says this. This is great. He says, you cannot believe without loving, nor love without believing. You tracking with that? You cannot believe without loving, nor love without believing. See, you can't believe. You can't say, I belong to Jesus. He's made me new. I'm a Christian. I'm clean. I'm whole. You can't say you believe and not love others well. They're linked together. If indeed we believe, the Bible says we're known by the love we have for one another. So you can't believe without loving. But on the contrary... You can't love others without first believing. Yes or no? Some people are hard to love. Y'all did. Some of y'all answered quick. Some of y'all are hesitant. You're like, I cannot speak because they're with me. <laughs> yes or no? Some people are just hard to love. Yeah. 
Some people are really hard to love. Some people are impossible to love. Some people are just hard to love, y'all. Some people are hard to love. And you can't love without believing. Because when you believe, that's when God says you get a new heart and a new mind and a new nature. The Holy Spirit indwells you. And you get a passion and you get a purpose. And you get an empowerment that you don't have on your own. And so you can't say you believe if you don't love, but you're never going to love well if you don't believe. And the Christian life demands this, this connection, this essential union between faith and love. Let me explain it this way. How many of y'all served in the military at one point in your life? Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for your service. I never did. Um, it's my understanding that Part of the purpose of basic training is to strip you of your own identity and force you into conformity where you are now this person. You are a member of the Marines. You are a member of the Army. It's, it's, it's get rid of identity, and now there's conformity to this. It would have been hard on me. I'm an Enneagram 3. I'm a high D. I like to do that. I'd probably still be peeling potatoes had I went into the military. But, but, but Christianity is being conformed formed into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we're conformed into his image and we're made to walk in his ways and we're remade to be new and to follow him. And the one who lavished love on others said, you continue to follow me and love others well. First, believe it's an act of our will. It's not just an emotion. It's a choice. It's a decision. Believe. It's an act of your will, not just emotions. Love's the same thing. It's not just emotions. It's a choice that you make. And listen, this is the litmus test. Let's be honest as a church. This is the litmus test. This is the mirror we hold up in front of our lives to know if our belief was indeed true. Does the world see us living out this command? I'm not asking how you determine whether or not you're living out. I'm not asking how you would answer that. I'm asking you how the people close to you, the people watching you, the people see you, how would they answer that? Are you loving well? And the way we love others is a sign that our hearts do indeed belong to God. And thus we're known in our community as people who love well. We don't want to be known as the heroes. We're not heroes. Jesus is the hero. We don't want to be known as theological watchdogs or rule keepers. No, we want to be known as people who unashamedly and without limit love everyone, even the unlovely. Behavioral therapists say it this way. It's an important lesson you can learn. Behavioral therapists say that emotion follows motion. Does that make sense? Your emotions follow the motion. And here's why that's powerful. Because some of you are like, I just don't feel like loving. I don't feel like they're lovable. I don't feel like loving them. Well, the actions are never going to follow that. Because emotion follows motion. You're never going to feel that way. But the difference would be if you start doing it, I'm going to start loving. I'm going to start choosing to obey. I'm going to start loving. The emotions always follow. Does that make sense? When you start living out the command, the emotions follow. Emotion follows motion. You start obeying, you start feeling. But if you wait to feel and never obey, you're never going to feel because emotion follows motion. That's why it's a command, not a suggestion. Start doing the right thing. You'll start feeling the right ways. Emotion follows motion. And our culture is so offended by just about everything. But I'll tell you this, no one has ever changed the world by walking around bitter. And Jesus had a mission. It was of love and forgiveness. And we are supposed to be agents of reconciliation. We're supposed to live out that love. And we've talked about a few different versions of this. But let me give you a couple helpful tools when it comes to loving well today. We just talked about this, but number one. Love is a commandment, 
and not an emotion. Because it's really, really hard to command your emotions. You can't always change the way you feel. How many of you remember sitting on the living room couch across from your mom, and your mom was like, wipe that look off your face? I don't know if I can. Stop acting that way. I don't know. I feel this way. So I can't look at you and be like, hey, be sad. And you're sad. I can't look at you and be like, hey, be happy. And you be happy. I can't command your emotions. Can't always change the way we feel. But the reason why love is a command is because regardless of how I feel, I'm called to do this. So it's a command, not a emotion. Number two, it's an action, not a feeling. When it's a feeling, we're in big trouble because quite often I don't feel like loving others. You ever feel that way? You wake up, man, I don't know if I really want to love my wife well today. I don't know if I want to love my kids well today. I don't know if I want to love my neighbor this day. I don't know if I want to love them really well because I just did this and they keep doing that. I don't know. Y'all ever feel like it? Am I the only one who ever struggles with those feelings? I'm up here in front of all y'all all alone sharing my heart, and y'all looking at me. It's hard sometimes, right? But love is an action, not a feeling. And if you wait for other people to make you feel lovely, then you're placing all of your happiness on them. And you've got to start doing the right things if you want to feel the right things, because emotion follows motion. So it's an action. Not only that, but love, love is a choice. You have to choose to do it. I have three kids, and for years, at each point of their lives, we're up two, three, four, five, six times a night, feeding them, changing their diapers. So I went to work one day with spit up all the way down my back, didn't even know it. You know, you're changing the diaper, and then you don't get there fast enough. Then you got poop all over you, and it's like, no, how many, how many of y'all love that? That little treat at 2 a.m.? I didn't love any of that, but I love them. I love them a lot. And I was willing to do things I didn't want to do because I love them, because love is a choice. Not because it was fun, not because it was convenient, but because it's a choice. It's an action, and I do it. And emotion follows motion. When I do the right things, I feel the right way. And if you wait to feel the right way, you're probably never going to do the right thing because quite often we don't feel the right way. Emotion follows motion, so it's a choice. And then last, you're probably on board with all three of those, but you're going to push back on this one. And I get it, and I understand that. But I would say to some of you that this must be the most important one that you need to hear, and maybe you don't want to embrace it, but I would encourage you to at least hear me out. Because this could unlock your freedom, and this could unlock your joy, and this could get you past some wounds that you haven't been able to heal from. That's number four, and it's this. It's, man, love is just not fair. What do you mean? Love's not fair. Like, it's not fair to obey the command to love, and you pour out love in an extravagant way, and you receive hate back. It's not fair to to love and receive rejection. It's not fair to love and for people to be mean. It's not fair to love and then ignore. It's not fair to love and then just be neutral. That's just not fair. What's fair is you want to pay people back. You know, Jesus says, pray for your enemies. I often pray they get a big old mole on their nose. I prayed for them. We always want God to be fair, but we don't want God to be fair with us. You don't want God to be fair with you. We want God to be just. If God were fair, then I would get what my sins deserve. Psalm 103, 10 through 11 says, He has not dealt with us as our sins deserve or repaid us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithful love towards those who fear him. He has not dealt with us as our sin deserves or repaid us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithful love toward us. You don't want him to be fair. He's just. And perhaps you want to love, but you feel like you still bear the scars of the time you tried. 
I just want to remind you there's someone else that still bears the scars of loving us. And you'll never look more like Jesus than when you experience a radical injustice and you just breathe out love. Radical expressions of love in the name of Jesus. We are commanded to both believe and to love. And you can't believe and not love, and you can't love without believing. And so the question this week is, how do I really love? Well, it begins with believing, and then as simply as I can put it is this. And you give others what God gave you. Give away what God has given to you. Haven't you experienced grace you didn't deserve? The goodness of God when you weren't perfect? We give to others what God has given us. It's the power of the gospel. That's our charge. And maybe some of you at this point, like you, you don't disagree with all of that. And that's really not your hang-up. Your hang-up is something different. And I know what your hang-up is because I've had your hang-up before in my life and I struggled with it. And so I just want to talk to those of you who like don't disagree with any of my four points. You're like, that's all fine. That's just not my problem. See, some people have a hard time loving because they themselves don't feel lovable. It's really hard to give away what you yourself don't feel like you deserve. And so you want to love others, but you don't know that you're even worthy of love. And so the thing that holds you back from, from loving others so well is feeling whole and complete and loved in your own life. Like your journey to obedience and freedom and wholeness starts with the simple fact that God loves you. He chose you. And if God loves you, then you're lovable. If God chose you, he didn't make a mistake. And the decision to love you cannot be wrong. I don't care what others have said about you. The voice of your creator is stronger. And you've been lied to and mistreated and misrepresented. And people have spoken things over you that aren't true. And your identity has been framed by someone other than God. And there's a journey to freedom that you can find. Just crack the door open. And begin to believe that you are lovable for no other reason than God says you are. And the more you begin to walk through that door and the wider that door begins to open, the more freedom you'll find. Because, guys, there's a part of me that you don't know. Like you, you know, most of you know this version of me, right? But you don't know the stuff that I don't tell people. You don't know the stuff I've tucked away. You don't know stuff that I've hidden, sins of my past and my life. You don't know. But God has seen all of that and without hesitation has lavished it on me. And so you just got to crack the door open. I am lovable for no other reason than God says I am. And the more you walk through the door, the wider it gets. And there is a freedom and a joy waiting on you I can't put in words. Because love isn't about the object of the love. It's not about me. <laughs> it's about the one who gives the love away. And that's something the world can't cancel. They can't cancel. The world can't cancel God's love for you. You met my wife earlier. We've been married going on 24 years. And out of everybody on campus today or this entire year, there's only one person's opinion that matters. And it's that five foot three, brown eyed, brown haired, gorgeous girl. That's the only opinion that matters to me. She loves me. 
She thinks I'm great. I don't really care what y'all think, to be honest. My wife loves me. And that's enough. My God loves me. And that's enough. Some of you need to walk out of here with one person's opinion and nobody else's. And then start walking through those steps of obeying the commandment to love, making the choice, choosing the action, believing it's okay if it's not fair. But emotion follows motion. You start doing the right things, you'll start feeling the right way. The command today is believe and love. And the question is, what's stopping the love of Jesus from flowing out of you in radical ways. What is it? What is it? You can't believe without loving. <laughs> and you can't love without believing. What is it that's stopping the love from flowing out of you? Let's pray. Lord, today we, we need your goodness and your grace and we're thankful for Jesus who chose us and when we believe we're accepted and never condemned. And I pray that the love of Jesus that flows to us would flow through us. That we would find ourselves to be lovely and that we would give away what you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen.